All right, staying with matters Zimbabwean, the country is set to hold a third mining in Daba this month amid heightened tensions over threats to withdraw operating licenses for several of the foreign-owned mines under the proposed indigenization and palm and drive. Zimbabwe's mining industry has become the country's main economic driver with the sector registering 44% growth in the last year. Joining us now to talk about everything that's going on there, particularly jitters around indigenization, is Vince Musewa, an independent economist. Vince, thanks so much for your time. Time. Well, September has now come. Many of these mining companies have had to submit revised proposals for indigenization. Government's talking 51%. Many of them were offering in the region of about 25%. And it seems to be a deadlock. Yeah, well, as we said in the beginning, that there's, a, there's a lot of confusion around what exactly one is the motive of this empowerment uh, drive. And number two, on the clarity of who is the referee. I mean, who makes the final decision, what gets done. I mean, I was reading earlier today that, for example, I think it's Amplats or Zimplats offered the government an alternative, which was a, a ground lease agreement for empowerment, where they would cede 30% value of equity of their mining rights to the government, right? And for them to actually be empowered. But I now hear that the government have now partnered with Billy Rottenbach, who is a you know, white Zimbabwean, to, to actually you know, ex explore those rights. So one is wondering, right? When everything is said and done, what exactly are we going to get on the ground? I mean, using that soccer metaphor, I think for mm. many of the um, mining companies, the goalposts keep on shifting. They were first told that they had to introduce structural changes within the company within a matter of five years. Then it became within a matter of a couple of months. Now it's as immediate as September. Are many of these companies in a position to re-engineer their shareholding so quickly? Well, you know, as you know, mining is probably funded by a lot of money that is long term, right? Uh, I mean, you put money in the ground and you want to get your return on investment. And it might take five to 10 years before you start actually getting. Uh, now, being asked to restructure in that process, you have to change all your cash flow projections, your shareholder loans have to be serviced. It's a nightmare. You know, I mean, uh, we have learned from South Africa and that BEE, where the black partner is borrowing in order to invest, is too risky because it assumes that, for example, the share price of the asset is going to increase. And if it doesn't, the debt just increases, it just balloons. So I, I am really, really, really concerned in that for example, the, the opposition is very quiet on the issue. I mean, they haven't come out guns blazing to say, listen, we're not agreeing on that. On the other side, I mean, I had a very interesting story today. Black Zimbabweans who own mining rights and have been doing a little bit of work, and those mines are being taken. Uh, by private, privately taken quietly by ministers who go there and say, listen, we're going to take this asset because you've done nothing. Because, you know what I'm saying? Let's so, talk about the mm. process of financing debt because yeah. this is where the commercial banks should also be coming to the party. Yes. But apparently there's a bit of a liquidity crisis in Zimbabwe right now. And in fact, the finance minister went as far as to call it a banking crisis mm. where many of the banks themselves were heavily geared and heavily leveraged. Are the banks in a position to come to the party here? Now, what has happened is, as far as I've heard, the revenues in the banks have started to increase, uh, you know, over time as, as, as uh, business goes on, obviously from, from the tobacco proceeds, from agriculture and mining, as we know. But, I mean, I was, for example, at an international bank in Zimbabwe trying to get funding for a transaction in Zim, and it just didn't happen. It was an excellent transaction where the returns were marvelous and it was a good asset, but we just could not find the money. Right, and looking at where Zimbabwe banks are spending their money, more than 50% of their deposits is being lent to distribution businesses, about two, three percent to manufacturing, about five percent. Mm -hmm. So even if they have the money, they're not actually plowing that money back into the productive sector because they don't just don't have the credit line. You know, so that's you know that's the dilemma. So then how would the uh, black consortia that want to acquire some of these mining assets fund their stakes? Because obviously there's the option of you know, taking the debt from the company yes, yeah. itself. Then there was the other option of some sort of an empowerment fund. Yes, yeah. Now, okay, for, from, from, from the latest, I mean, I, 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 the Minister of uh, Economic Planning and Investment Planning was in Australia or somewhere where he was asked what would happen if the buyer does not have money. And his response was there's no deal. Then empowerment won't happen. But obviously he comes from the MDC side, right? So he would say that. On the other side, there has been a board and empowerment, national empowerment, 
empowerment board that has been set up, which is to me typically a ZANU PF platform, right? That says, listen, we are going to get, uh, we are going to tax companies, right? Uh, maybe based on revenue or the annual profits, they have to contribute to this fund, and then we're going to actually use these funds to actually fund empowerment. Listen, the, the, the World Bank says that Zimbabwe owns 8.8 .8 billion, which is 118% of the GDP. It means it will take Zimbabwe two years to pay that debt. Six billion of that is in arrears, right? Zimbabwe needs 13 billion rand to get its energy sector going. It needs another 10 billion for infrastructure, right? Manufacturing and industry is operating below 50% uh, capacity. Unemployment levels are 80%. Right, and those are the critical priorities than actually funding empowerment, as far as I'm concerned. Very briefly, Vince, mm. the interesting factor though is although on the Zimbabwean stock exchange we've seen mining shares battered a little bit, it hasn't really impacted on the industrial side of the market. And today we've seen a bit of a pickup in mining shares. So investors are jittery but they're not really talking about wholesale withdrawal from Zimbabwe, largely because of the huge platinum reserves that Absolutely. are in the country. Yeah. So will this impede on investment ultimately? Well, you know what, I, in my opinion, investors who want to be in Zim are already there. Right, they're not going to wait, and they're not going to wait for what's happening in the media or what policy. They are already there, making their money. There's money being made. I mean, that's for sure. But I question the issue of judging the stock exchange as a measurement of economic activity, because you must remember one: the Zimbabwe stock exchange is very liquid, illiquid. It's very inefficient, and there's two, three big pension funds that own most of the counters. So there isn't that liquidity and investors are not rushing in and out. So it's difficult for one to actually measure that as a temperature of what's going on. Thanks so much for your time, Vince Musiwa there, just giving us his insights on the current situation that's really unnerved investors with indigenization proposals due out September of 2011.